It's Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 45. You remember from two weeks ago when we were last in the book of Mark, Jesus is being in Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. He entered a synagogue. He preached there and cast out an unclean spirit. Now we begin in verse 29, and immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she waited on them. When evening came after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. He said to them, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him, and falling on his knees before him, and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city but stayed out in the unpopulated areas, and they were coming to him from everywhere. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. One of America's best known poems is the new Colossus. It's on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. You'll recognize it. It begins... Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. And with those words, multitudes of immigrants were warmly welcomed to America with conditions. In order to enter the country, they had to pass through Ellis Island, where all were given a physical. Those who failed, who had obvious health problems, were sent back home. So Ellis Island became known as the Island of Tears. The world could give us its tired and poor, but not its sick and undesirables. I don't mention that to make a criticism, but a contrast with the kingdom that Christ offered. He sought the sick and felt such compassion for them that he put his hands on their disease. He touched untouchables. That's the story of our passage. Mark chapter 1 verses 29 through 45. His ministry began when he entered Galilee preaching the good news of the kingdom of God, entered a synagogue where he taught with authority and cast out a demon. Immediately, Mark says, Jesus left the synagogue and entered Peter's house Or as someone wrote, he passed from the place of preaching to the place of rest. But Mark is a book of action, not rest. And the action continues because Peter's mother-in-law was there and lying sick in bed with a raging fever. P. 
Peter and the others wanted, wasted no time uh, in telling the Lord of uh, her condition. They did it immediately, Mark wrote, and the Lord wasted no time in responding, which revealed something about him. He healed her as quickly and powerfully as he delivered the man with the demon. But he did it with the, the gentleness and the bedside manner of the great physician. He came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her. Matthew and Luke both record this same miracle, but only Mark states that Jesus took her by the hand. And that's characteristic of Mark. Later in chapter 5, he tells how Jesus took a girl by the hand and raised her from the dead. In chapter 8, he will take a, a young man with a dumb spirit by the hand. He touched the sick. He didn't need to do that. Uh, he simply commanded the demon to come out of the man earlier in the previous passage in, in verse 25, and it obeyed at his word. Luke wrote that he rebuked the fever, and it left, speaking of Peter's mother-in-law, what happened is what he willed to happen. He commanded, and it occurred. His word was enough. Holding her hand wasn't necessary for healing, but it was a natural response to her condition and an expression of his concern for her. That's his nature. As I said, his response to Peter's request reveals a lot about him, Re reveals a lot about his person. He cares and he acts decisively. So later, Peter could write, casting all your cares on him, for he cares for you. And Peter could write that because Peter had witnessed it. And his mother-in-law was so completely healed that she got up and, Mark writes, waited on them. Waited on the Lord, waited on Peter and all of his companions there in the house. She didn't need any recovery time. She was, she was filled with energy and became very active. He not, only, he not only heals, he enables the, heal, the healed to serve, just as he would make the disciples fishers of men. It's his power. He enables. Earlier, Mark wrote that after the events in the synagogue, news about him spread everywhere. The, the people learned very quickly that Jesus had power over spirits and sickness. So when evening came, they left their homes and brought to Jesus all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. But not until after the sun set. And the reason for this schedule is because according to the rabbi's interpretation of the law, people could not go to a physician during the Sabbath. Physicians, doctors were not to work. People were not to engage them in work. That was their interpretation of such things. Doing healing, helping others on the Sabbath was breaking the Sabbath. And since by Jewish reckoning a new day begins at sunset, with us we think of the new day beginning with the sunrise, but according to Jewish interpretation of the law, it began at sunset. It's the same today. You go to Israel and you'll see that on a Saturday, uh, Saturday evening. That's when the Sabbath ends. It begins on Friday evening when the sun goes down. Uh, it ends on Saturday evening when the, the sun goes down and that's Sunday for them and so all of a sudden people come out, the buses begin running and people dress up for that, uh, that day and uh, go into the city to, uh, to enjoy the beginning of the week. Well, it was the same here. The, the, uh, the sun set and they came out and they went to Simon's house and a lot of them went there. According to verse 33, the whole city had gathered at the door. Probably 
not to be understood literally as every single person in the town of Capernaum was there at the door of uh, Simon's house. More likely what this is is a vivid description uh, that is so characteristic of the Gospel of Mark. He writes in that way using the word immediately and using these kinds of descriptions. So it's what we might say is the house was mobbed with people. There was a great company of people there. They came in mass and they didn't leave disappointed. We read in verse 34, And he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. The Lord healed them all. There was no affliction of any kind. And this this indicates a wide variety of, of, of ailments that were represented there in all of these people. But there was not one of those that escaped his authority and power. He healed them all. And what this also indicates in this uh, variety of afflictions that are described here is the Bible distinguishes between physical illness and demon possession, as well as demon possession and and madness, which literally in, in the New Testament is being moonstruck So, the Bible distinguishes between demon possession and physical illness. It distinguishes between what we would call insanity and demon possession. And here, again, the demons were speaking out and trying to identify Jesus, just as that one in the synagogue had when it called him the Holy One of God. But Jesus, again, wouldn't have it, and he shut them up. It was as though even though they opposed him, even though they worked to destroy his creation and in possessing an individual, a man or a woman, they were attacking the apex of God's creation, that which is created in God's image. In fact, the only aspect of God's creation that is created in his image in possessing such people, they were attacking that image and attacking God. But even so, they were compelled to acknowledge Him. He is Lord. And they had to bow before Him. But He would not have His name and honor identified with the host of hell. He would reveal Himself to the nation in His own way and His own time. And so again, He tells them not to speak. And again, what this reveals about him, all of this, is he was not only a powerful king, but a compassionate king. At the end of a a long and tiring day, neither his power nor his kindness ran out. He healed all who came. He turned none away. And the result was Capernaum became the healthiest place on earth. Bodies were, 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 were made clean. Minds were clear. Jesus spent the Sabbath active in His Father's service. And Sunday was no day of leisure for Him either. He, he, got, he went to work that evening healing people. And then early in the morning He got up, according to verse 35, when it was still dark, to pray. Now, it's it's good to be active. It's good to work hard. It's good to accomplish goals and help people. But busy schedules can become the enemy of our prayer life. I think we've all experienced that. There There are things, good things, necessary things that have to be done. It's what someone called the tyranny of the of the urgent. And so the result of that, unfortunately, is prayer time gets put off to the end of the day when when, uh, we finally come to a a time when we can pray, but then we find we're tired, fatigue overwhelms us, and what suffers is our prayer life. I uh, sound like I know what I'm talking about. I do. It's called the tyranny of the urgent. Well, Jesus mastered that. He knew how essential 
it was to do all of the things that he did. He, he was constantly at work. He was healing on the Sabbath. He was healing on the day after the Sabbath. And yet he got up early to pray because he knew how vital to his life prayer and fellowship with the Father were. And so he rose early, found a secluded, a secluded place, and was praying there. He needed that time with the Father for his own personal joy. He needed that time with the Father as well to resupply his strength and wisdom as a man. And in his humanity, not in his deity, but in his humanity, he got that. He got refreshment. He got wisdom. He got all that he needed the way that we must. And that is through prayer and study. I read somewhere that Martin Luther said, I have so much to do that I must spend the first three hours of each day in prayer. Now, I don't want to suggest that that's the standard for us, and I'm not sure Martin Luther did that every day of his life, got up three hours before he had to do the busy things of his day and spent those three hours in prayer. But it does show how important prayer was to the great reformer, and I think what we would find if we were able to study the lives of great saints, men and women alike, and their success in the Christian life, that they were people of prayer. Certainly our Lord was. He must have been in prayer for a number of hours when Peter and the others found him, because it would have been daylight, and it would have been daylight because the crowds were back. And that's what they came to speak to him about urgently. They said to him, everyone is looking for you. In other words, what are you doing here? What, what are you doing off by yourself? The crowds are back. The people are clamoring to see you. I think there was something of a reproach in that. Certainly there was a rebuke in what Peter was saying and the others because they felt he was missing a big opportunity. His popularity was growing. And he needs to seize the moment. That, th this was, they thought, a, a popular grassroots movement in the nation. And it was something of that. They were very impressed by these crowds. They were very impressed with numbers. And of course, who wouldn't be? Well, Jesus wasn't. He knew what was producing this excitement and how shallow it all was. Uh, they, they were coming for a miracle worker, not a savior. For healing, not repentance. It sounds a lot like modern times and the interest that so many people show in uh, the, the Pentecostal and charismatic movements and, and how so many are drawn to those who claim to heal and do miracles. That's human nature. That's so typical of human nature. We have a natural concern for our physical welfare over our spiritual need. The physical is important. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not denying that. And you consider the people that are healed and the people that are afflicted all through the Gospels and, and you realize how, how tragic that was and, and how afflicted they truly were. What a concern it was. But, but the Lord had a different priority. He, unlike charlatans today, really did miracles. But as Calvin said, they were merely appendages to the Word. He was a preacher first and foremost. So he no doubt surprised the disciples when he answered them in verse 38, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also. For that is what I came for. What? What are you saying? Leave the crowds? We have the crowds here. That's not what he came to do. His priority was teaching. His priority was preaching. That was his mission, and that's our mission. That's what Paul said to Timothy. Some of the last words that he gave to Timothy, preach the word. That's what heals the soul, and that's what Jesus gave himself to. 
And we read, he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. Well, while he was doing that, a leper approached him and asked for mercy. Luke, who is the physician, uh, who was a doctor, described the man in his parallel passage as full of leprosy. So he gives a kind of medical analysis. This man was not just a leper. He was in the severe stages of leprosy, full of leprosy. He must have been a ghastly sight. Leprosy is a hideous disease, a dehumanizing disease. William Barclay described it graphically in one of his commentaries. He wrote, it might begin with little nodules which go on to ulcerate. The ulcers develop a foul discharge. Vocal cords become ulcerated and the voice becomes hoarse. Hands and feet always ulcerate. Slowly the sufferer becomes a mass of ulcerated growths. The average course of that kind of leprosy is nine years, and it ends in mental decay, coma, and ultimately death. And in the course of this protracted disease, parts of the body fall off, the nose, the fingers, toes, hands, feet. Uh, a man suffering this form of leprosy, Barclay wrote, dies by inches. Well, that form of leprosy is known today as Hansen's disease, and it was prevalent in the Middle East, but there are many types of leprosy in the Bible. Uh, it's a very broad term, actually, and refers to various skin disorders. Now, this man was full of this disease. He had a severe case of it. That is the tragedy physically, but there's more to it than that. One of the worst aspects of leprosy was the alienation that it brought to the sufferer. He or she was cut off from everyone, from friends, from family, everyone except fellow sufferers. A leper could not touch anyone because if he did, that person became unclean and that person was cut off from society. So the law required that a, a leper give fair warning wherever he went. He was required to cover his mouth and cry out, unclean, unclean, and, according to the law, live outside the camp. There's a spiritual aspect to this. In fact, there is mainly from the law, uh, from the book of Leviticus, and throughout the Gospels, mainly a spiritual aspect to this. Leprosy pictures sin. It pictures the consequences of sin. The analogy between the two is very clear as you reflect upon it. Leprosy affected the whole person, body and mind. It separated people, as I said, from, from the nation and from its worship and reduced the sufferer to the walking dead. The law content, condemned him to isolation, separation, and loneliness. Those are the effects of sin. It affects every aspect of a person's life, his or her body and mind. It, it separates from God his life and blessings. That's what sin does. And its consequence is death. Spiritual death now immediately, physical death later, and then eternal death. Eternal separation from God and his glory and all joy forever. And that is every man by nature. We are all born into that condition. We come into this world that way. This man, this leper, was a living illustration of all of that. Separated from the living. And yet, he didn't keep his distance. He boldly approached the Lord fell at his feet, and in his raspy, weakened voice pleaded, if you are willing, you can make me clean. It's clear from that that he didn't doubt the Lord's power to heal. So he came to him in faith, 
confident that he could do that. That's what made him bold enough to come close. But sometimes it's easier to believe in God's power than in his mercy. Easier to believe that in his ability than believe in his willingness. And the man knew his frightening condition. He, he knew he was under the sentence of the law, that he was unclean and he was condemned to wander alone. The Lord had a right and a reason to withdraw from him. He understood that. In fact, rabbis in the Lord's day boasted about throwing rocks at lepers to keep them away. Others would, would run and hide at the sight of a leper. But the Lord didn't hide or throw rocks, just the opposite. He was deeply moved by this man in his terrible and helpless condition. And the Lord's mercy is always equal to his power. Verse 41, moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. It's really an astonishing image. The pure and clean Jesus putting his, his hand on the ugly, leprous flesh of this man. How could he do that? Well, the answer is he is the God of all comfort and mercy. But then you think, perhaps this has entered your mind as it did mine. How could he do that without becoming unclean himself? Because if one touches a leper... And other people and things that are considered unclean, then the, that person himself or herself becomes unclean. The law requires that, states that. And yet the law also, I think, gives the answer in the passage about such things in Leviticus chapter 11 and in verse 36. That is a passage about rules of uncleanness. If a person touches a dead body, for example, he is unclean. But Leviticus 11 verse 36 states that if something unclean falls into a spring or cistern, the water is not unclean. The reason for that, it would seem, is the water is the means of cleansing. Just like the River Jordan that washed away the leprosy of Naaman who dipped in it. The river remained clean. Now that's Christ. In John chapter 4 and verse 14 and then in chapter 7 and verse 37, He invites the thirsty to come to Him. He is the source of living water. He is the fountain and stream of water that springs up to eternal life. So He can let the leper come near and He can touch the leper safely, giving him health while not receiving the leper's contamination and corruption. And the reason is, he's the source of cleansing. He's the river of life. And Jesus didn't hesitate. He, he put his hand on this man who was full of leprosy, a, a hopeless case, and Mark wrote, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Again, that's the heart of the Lord. It, it moved him to think not of himself, to put himself in apparent peril and act for the good of others. He is quick to help because he is always moved to compassion. But this not only reveals the Lord's character, it revealed his office. It's the proof, further proof, that he is the Messiah, that he is the King of Israel. Isaiah prophesied that when the Messiah came, miracles would happen. The lame would walk, the blind would see, the dead would rise. Here, a leper was cleansed. So, the instruction the Lord gave the man may seem a little strange. Here, this is the proof that the Messiah had come. In fact, when John the Baptist is in prison and he's seeking to know, are you the one we were expecting? One of the things that Jesus says is the lepers are cleansed. Lepers were never cleansed. Here they are. 
So this fits with Isaiah, this fits with the prophets. And so we're a little surprised when we read in verses 43 and 44, and he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them, that is to those priests. That was his legal and spiritual obligation. This is what the law required. And Jesus was strict about obeying the law. Now, he wasn't strict about the traditions of the rabbis. In fact, they would have condemned him for healing Peter's mother-in-law on the Sabbath. They will, would condemn him for healing a, a leper on the Sabbath, healing anyone on the Sabbath. They didn't understand that... Uh, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Uh, so the Lord, while not concerned so much about their traditions and their interpretations of the law, the strict understanding of the law, he was very concerned about and kept it perfectly. And the law required that he go to the priests and that they, he submit himself to them. And he says, do that immediately. And it would be a testimony to the priest. They, they had to engage in an elaborate ritual of killing a bird over running water and then setting another bird free. It was a ritual that no priest had ever done. Now, so what a testimony that would have been. Leprosy was incurable. They had not seen this before. In fact, it was said that it was as difficult to cleanse a leper as to raise the dead, it's, which is a way of saying it's impossible. So what a testimony this man would be when he went to the temple. So off he went to the priest, but in spite of the Lord's stern warning, the chapter ends, but he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. We can understand the man's joy and his inability to contain himself. This was a man who was full of leprosy, and suddenly he's clean, he's healthy. He, he feels invigorated. He, he's full of joy. It's very difficult to, to, to not begin to shout about what's happened. Still... There is a time for speaking and a time for silence. This was unwanted publicity that made the Lord's ministry more difficult. He can't go into the cities. He has to stay in un unpopulated areas. It made things more difficult. But what stands out to us here about the Lord's ministry was his compassion. With, with both Peter's mother-in-law and the leper, he, he touched them. He put his hands on the sick. Donald Ray Barnhouse took a lesson from that, which he illustrated from the testimony a friend of his told him. The man, he said, had been an infidel. He'd been a, a confirmed, hardened unbeliever. And then he was in a car wreck, and through that, the man was brought to faith. He was asked if the accident was the reason for his conversion, having a, a brush with death. Was he converted due to his fear of death? He said no. And then he explained what happened. A limousine stopped at the site of the wreck, and a lady got out and walked toward him. He was staggering around and covered in blood. But she took his arm to steady him. He, he, he protested uh, because he was bleeding, he was a mess, and in a, a natural instinct of manners, he didn't want her to get close and stain her fine clothes, but she didn't listen to him. She had her chauffeur lift him uh, up and put him in the back seat of her limousine. And when he again worried about her contact with him, she said, What's, what is a dress? What is upholstery? You're hurt. And he said, it broke my heart. 
Barthouse then commented, my dear friends, if you are going to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've got to take people by the hand. You mustn't look to see if their hands are dirty. Well, that's the way of Christ. He took sick people by the hand. He, he touched untouchables out of compassion. We're to be people like that. And our compassion, our concern for others, can be greatly used by the Lord. Nevertheless, I must say, it's not our care and compassion that converts. It is the saving power of the Lord and His willingness to save. And save the worst of sinners. That's really the lesson here. It is good news. The Lord is willing and able to save. I'm a Calvinist. I'm a five-point Calvinist. I was glad to see that Chris is going to begin teaching on TULIP this week. The Bible teaches that. The Bible teaches each of those five points. They are absolutely logical. They are each strictly biblical. It teaches total depravity. The Scriptures do. The Bible teaches total depravity. Not that we are all as corrupt as we could be. We are not. There are degrees of that. But the, the effect of sin, sin itself has infected every part of our person. We are completely affected by it. The result is we are guilty. We are separated from God. We don't want Him. We don't seek Him. So we need Him to seek us. That's the second point, unconditional election. He has chosen a people for Himself from all eternity. It's unconditional. It's not that He looked down through time and He saw these lovely people or He saw that people would believe or He saw some good works. What He saw was lepers. What He saw was people completely infected with sin and in utter rebellion against Him. None seek for God, no, not one. So what He chose, He chose unconditionally. It was His will and His will alone. And because He chose, we will come. Well, we'll come because of the third and the fourth points, actually. Christ died for His elect and the Holy Spirit will draw them. That's limited atonement or particular redemption and irresistible grace. Having bought and brought, we will continue in faith. We will continue in faith to the end. That's the fifth point. That's perseverance of the saints, which, which really is the perseverance of the Lord with the saints. He keeps us saved. He supplies us with faith. He is the one that gives us the energy to believe and the faith to believe just as he did Peter's mother-in-law. Now I mention all of that to, to, to make the point that salvation is all of God. He does it from start to finish. And he does it from start to finish because we cannot and we will not in and of ourselves. And he cares enough about fallen sinners to do that. So, is He willing to save? Yes. Just look at all that He has done. D don't think that because He chooses and He redeems and He draws and He keeps that He's not willing to save all who call on Him. He is. Now, if you say, I don't like this idea of election. I don't like this idea of God choosing and not choosing. I won't have that God. Well, that's God. He's absolutely sovereign. But if, if you don't want Him, then you can't complain that you don't have Him or don't have His life. You've made your choice, and you're getting what you want, aren't you? But if you desire what Christ offers, forgiveness, cleansing from sin, a new life and eternal life, then come to Him. His word to you is the same as His word to that leper. I am willing. 
We're proud as a nation of those welcoming words on the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. Jesus' words of welcome in Matthew 11 are far better. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. All, sick as you are, come. He won't cast you out. He is building a nation of sick people, of guilty people, and making them whole. If you're here without Christ, don't delay. Come to Him, believe in Him. His death has paid the penalty fully and completely, and He heals the sin-sick soul. May God help you to do that, and help the rest of you, all who have believed in Him, to live for Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this great text and all that it reveals about your Son, but really all it reveals about the triune God who have the same goal, who are united, one God in three persons, and you act in concert, and you are compassionate, and you heal and you restore, and you will glorify. We thank you for these great truths. We thank you that you have extended your grace to a fallen world and have saved sinful men and women. We thank you for your goodness and your grace and your Son, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.